Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, welcome to the session. It's entitled Trust Revisited, the U.S. Climate Change Imperatives. As many of us know, um, the United States left the Paris Agreement four years ago, and now that the Biden administration has rejoined, we were having a little bit of discussion here with my colleagues about what, what this means for re-engagement um, for the business community, for the, uh, the diplomatic community, and essentially for the world itself. So let me just, uh, we're, we're having a little bit of technical issues, so we'll have some people joining um, perhaps uh, as we go along. But uh, let me just start uh, with who we have here. Um, first, we have um, Adele Morris, many of you may know. She is a, a Joseph A. Peachman Senior Fellow in the Economic Studies Program at Brookings Institution and the Policy Director at Brookings for Climate and Energy and Economics Projects. Welcome, Adele. We have June Armina, Ar Arima, Senior Policy Fellow of Energy and Environment for Economic Research Institute of East Asia and a professor at the University of Tokyo. Welcome. And we have Michael Johnston, the retired executive vice president of the Capital Group. Welcome, Michael. So I'm just going to open it up and, and start with some questions, and um, and then we'll we'll open it up for the audience a little bit later. But let me just start with you, Adele. Um, so the United States has rejoined the Paris Agreement, as as we all know, but still needs to announce its national determined contribution. What policy tools? Do the, does the Biden administration already have to enable an ambitious climate pledge under the Paris Agreement? And what additional measures would Congress need to adopt to keep such a pledge credible? Well, thank you. Thank you for so much for inviting me to join you. I'm delighted to be here. There's a little bit of background noise, so if you're not speaking, it would be great if you mute your microphone. Maybe that will help. Um, so the Biden administration has about four key strategies that they can use. One is using existing authority, and he's already talked about using the whole of government approach. Um, he can um, he can exert some influence through the independent agencies. He can pursue spending measures that then can reduce emissions. And he can seek new legislative authority through new regulations. We're still getting a lot of background. Thomas, can you, could, you, could you mute your microphone? Thank, thank you. So, so let me talk about. Um, I actually, I'm sorry. I, I think it's uh, Michael, if you could mute your. That'd be great. Um, I. Sucks. Yeah, it's at the bottom of the screen. Just looks like a little microphone. Yeah, I don't see the. It's in the bottom left of the screen, next to a thing that looks like a camera. Well, in the bottom of my screen. That it? It's okay. It's all right. We'll, All right. We'll probably make well, I'll, I'll do my best. It's a little tricky to concentrate on what I'm saying with the noise in the background. Um, so let's talk about what he can do with his existing authority. Um, first, well, obviously, we can rejoin Paris, and that was an important signal. But the question is, what is going to be the target uh, of, of our nationally determined contribution? One tool is to immediately reverse all the things that the Trump administration was doing. So if you want to see a compendium of regulatory actions that uh, the Trump administration pursued and how they're being reversed by the Biden administration, we have a, a deregulation tracker on the Brookings website, which uh, is, is very comprehensive, not just for climate, but all manner of regulatory measures. You come to microphone the Biden administration can use the clean air. Okay, let me see where we are. Okay, I am not. Okay, I'm in. I'll talk to you later. Thanks, Bob. If, there, if you could please mute your microphone while you're not speaking, there's a tremendous amount. Well, welcome, Stephen. If you could mute your microphone, that would be great. Yes, I will. Sorry. Um, sorry. 
Um, okay, so so under the Clean Air Act, the Obama administration pursued the Clean Power Plan at power plant primarily, and uh, the idea was to use that as a model for regulating other dictionary source categories. Oh, that an approach, and it's very slow, very subject to the administrative administration's priority. And so, as we saw, the Trump administration reversed that. So we'll be having some kind of seesaw and regulatory ambition. And we now have a more skeptical Supreme Court. So some of that is probably going to meet resistance through litigation. Um, because there are things to do is, is you know, manage how oil and gas and other fossil fuels are produced on federal lands. He can, he's already um, revoked the permission for the Keystone XL pipeline. We see all that. But I think the problem is that because these measures are slow or modest, they're not going to add up to a lot of emissions abatement. So really, he's going to need new authority. And that's where Congress comes in. And we're, we're, we're just on the razor's edge of Democratic control of the Senate. And we'll have to see what could pass, perhaps, through a reconciliation bill. And I'd be happy to talk about that more as we go along. Great. But I, I, I think other countries are going to have to hold the U.S. to fire to ensure that they really can um, make a credible commitment under the Paris Agreement. Great, thank you, Adele. I'm going to come to June in just one second. <clears throat> Michael, did you not even find the microphone? We're getting lots and lots of. There's lots of interference. I can't understand. It. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, so so let, me, let me just uh, make a couple of more introductions. Uh, we are joined also by Michael Johnson, the retired executive vice president of the Capital Group. Yes. Uh, we have Thomas Lovejoy, who is a professor, a professor of environmental science and policy at George Mason, among many, many, many other things. I've known Tom for a long, long time. Um, and we are joined by Stephen Brendan, I chair of European Climate Foundation of the United Kingdom. So, uh, a little bit of technical talk is getting the end. So, let me turn to you as a follow up to Dell's um, keeping uh, the, the U.S. administration's feet to the fire. Um, can you tell us what you expect the Biden administration? Um, to facilitate decarbonization, in particular in the Asia region, and how the Asia is going to work to keep the Obama administration um, in the fire. I mean, the Biden administration. Apologies. <clears throat> okay, uh, is it me? Uh, who is supposed to talk about that? Okay, so can I talk now? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, um, uh, thank you very much. And um, I know that uh, Biden's situation is very active on climate diplomacy, and uh, he's going to host uh, the climate summit on the 22nd of April. And uh, how how ambitious the U.S. Uh, climate target would be, and that is, of course, one interest. But another interest is the uh, U.S. is going to push other major economies to raise uh, their level of ambition, uh, including India or Indonesia and so on. And uh, the difficulty of Asia region is uh, their energy mix is too much dominated by fossil fuels. And uh, their interest is, of course, uh, they are pursuing climate change agenda, but climate change agenda is not the only agenda they are pursuing. Uh, there are many other priorities, such as job creation, or healthcare, or education, or poverty eradication, and so on. And uh, to be frank, climate change is not the number one priority in those countries. So if the energy transition uh, turns out to be very much costly uh, for the final consumer or industry, then uh, that kind of policy will not be swallowed by those countries. So I know that uh, you know experts in Biden situation are very much, how can I say, ideolo uh, idealistic and pursuing something like a leapfrog uh, energy transition uh, from fossil fuel dominant energy mix uh, to uh, renewable energy dominant uh, energy mix. But that will not happen overnight. 
And unless uh, that uh, clean energy mix will be uh, affordable as the current one, then uh, that energy mix will not be realized. So you need to consider some sort of, you know, the traditional uh, arrangement or traditional uh, decarbonization. And first, uh, you know, low carbon future and then uh, decarbonized future. So that would be more pragmatic solution uh, for Asian countries. And I know that EU has been very active in exporting its LNG uh, to Asian region. And that was a good uh, start uh, for a uh, few, few switching uh, from coal to natural gas. And I still understand, uh, consider that uh, the presence of US LNG is quite important uh, for lower uh, emission future uh, in Asia. And also, uh, given that Asia will continuously use fossil fuel for that being, I think they are definitely need uh, CCUS or CCS technologies. And if, for example, such countries Japan and the US could collaborate uh, in demonstrate uh, such a technology in the third country, like Indonesia or others, then that would be tremendously helpful uh, for the decarbonization of that region. And as well, uh, the hydrogen is another important technology for decarbonizing that region. But again, uh, hydrogen uh, will not be produced from renewable overnight. Uh, at the beginning, uh, that would be produced from fossil fuels like natural gas. Then again, you need uh, CCUS. Uh, for uh, neutralizing carbon emissions. So I think uh, there are many, how can I say, uh, policy agenda in the region, and perhaps uh, U.S. could uh, take a pragmatic approach by say, uh, conducting some demonstration project or uh, the exporting uh, cleaner fossil fuels, uh, like a, a natural gas or something. So that is what uh, I see a uh, more pragmatic solution uh, from the Asian perspective. So I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. So I think that, <clears throat> I'm going to turn to you. <clears throat> excuse me. I'm going to turn to you, Michael, and ask you a question. And then um, we'll let you drop off afterwards and you can't find the microphone. It seems to be causing so much uh, background. So let me just go ahead and ask you a question. Uh, what will replace toxic fuel as the non polluting energy source in your Um I couldn't hear all that, but. Uh, I think this is a difficult time to attempt to switch energy for sources for the world. And it's a difficult time because there's so little trust in science and so much of this is based on science. And until we get more trust in what our scientists are telling us, it's going to be difficult for the populations to make the potential switches. The, the uh, argument for science is that there is enormous amounts of energy flowing into this planet every day from the sun and also enormous amounts of energy flowing into this planet from gravity of other planets as well as our own. And all we have to do is tap into these non-invasive energy sources to rid our planet of the occlusion of fossil fuels. And we are trying to do this with uh, th sources like methane, which are 50 times more uh, cotty uh, uh, trapping heat in this planet. And until we can include the vast majority of population dependent on fossil fuel in uh, the corporations that plant that our planet, it's going to be difficult to do. And this is a year, I think, in which we're going to test that. And the test is going to be run in competing corporations and institutions that have lost their viability with the populations. And it'll be interesting to see how this comes out. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Michael. I, I, I 
I, I think if uh, it's all right with you, we'll let you drop off since it, you, you seem to be causing the, the background. We can hear you perfectly, but if you're not muted, we can't hear the others. So uh, I'm gonna turn to you, um, uh, Tom. Um, picking up there in our Biden administration, and I know that you have worked for years on uh, the, the natural solutions. Um, what do you see as the biggest opportunity here with the Biden administration? So I think uh, one of the really big opportunities is, is with the biological piece of climate change. And just to remind everybody, I mean, fossil fuels are just old photosynthesis. And we've actually destroyed enough terrestrial ecosystems that half of the carbon from them is in the atmosphere, contributing to climate change. And that, that carbon can come back if we reforest. It also could get worse if there is major reforestation. And of course, in all of that, everybody always worries about my favorite place as a biologist, namely the Amazon, because there's 100 billion tons of carbon locked up in the ecosystem. So not particularly apparent at the moment is there is high level negotiations going on led by John Kerry on the US side and the Brazilian former minister on the other side on a climate and Amazon agreement. The aspiration being to have something that's already in place for the time of the climate summit on the 21st of April. Uh, in a sense, following the pattern helped to make the Paris Accord so successful because there were bi-national agreements in advance between the U.S. Uh, and Brazil and some other countries. Uh, it may not be getting a lot of headlines, but it's a really important piece of what's going on. Great. So turning to the more personal Stephen, um, you know, the Catholic Church commits us to having a trial tonight. What has been your own personal response to the goal itself? That was you, Stephen. Sorry, can you repeat? I didn't understand. There's a lot of noise. I, I know. It's a theory. We're trying to work on that. I apologize for that. Um, the Catholic Church's commitment to carbon neutrality by the year 2030. Uh, I'm curious what your own personal um, commitment has been and your leadership role towards it. Yeah, we the European Climate Foundation we do a lot of work with the Catholic Church, the Vatican, and uh, we are running a project in the UK to move the churches, faith groups in the UK to carbon neutrality by 2030. And uh, we want to present our first funding at COP26, COP the end of this year. And uh, we are in close communication with the Vatican because they say, we have that aim, but we don't know how to do it. And we want to learn from your experience what you're doing. And so we are very close to the way that we find ways of achieving, but also understanding the problem. And, uh, and obviously, most places of worship are not open the whole week. That certain days of the week that they're closed, other days of the week that they're open. So there are all kinds of complicated issues that we have to work with and understand. And we work in closely with uh, the university here in the place with various universities. They're advising us to do all the analysis. And uh, we're well on our way. We started in November. And we hope to give a progress report to the Vatican by June. Where we start, what we can achieve, and uh, 
But it's interesting because they're very open and they're very much sure. Uh, they want to take what we learn in, uh, with our work as a blueprint for others to actually achieve what they set out to do. And uh, so it's, it's working for the, the, I think we're making very good uh, inroads and uh, can, can really, but also in most cases, most short leadership is key because it's not always evidence that the leadership is not is behind it because you still find septic in the in the leadership of not only the Catholic church but the other church faith no. so uh, that is also going to come to let the scientists speak that's what we're trying to achieve to make sure that that they really understand that state. And uh, as you said earlier, obviously, in, also for the Biden administration, uh, uh, climate is obviously important. But the other, many other priorities, and the same place for faith groups, you know, climate is important, but also they also have many other priorities to look at. And so we have to make sure that, that our topic is well received and uh, well understood. And, uh, I think we're making good progress. And, uh, we hope we put uh, um, yeah, a good understanding, good paper or good presentation around the COP26 of what faith groups can achieve and how we can uh, uh, use that type of uh, debate in the way of going forward. Thank you, Stephen. I know they like to keep it uh, very on time, and so we uh, we have about uh, ten or ten or so more minutes left. Uh, so let me just uh, ask if uh, I, see, I think I see a question here from P. P. Ish. No. Hmm. Okay. All right. It doesn't seem to be working. Um, so we'll uh, we'll go back to the panel. Um, and you know, let's, let, why don't we open it up um, for discussion as best we can here? Um, and I'll come back to to you, Adele. You had a, a follow up to talk about a little. Yeah, I can. Honestly, I really enjoy maybe five or ten percent of what folks were saying. So I don't know. If this is really. Grateful here. So, can I turn it back to you? I, I'm about ready to jump ship here. Okay. Um, well, my apologies then. Um, I, I think that this technology is not on our side this morning. So, um, why don't we go ahead and bring it to a close? And I'll just thank everyone and and say um, I, I'm really confident that the Biden administration will spend the next four years focusing on climate once we get past this COVID. So, um, really, I, my apologies, and I really appreciate everyone's um, time this morning. It was lovely to meet you all. Thank you.